Well, and it's not always about the money. I mean, it is when you see it when a wholesaler puts it out there. But if you've handled that situation for a seller, you know, you don't know what they're going through. So if they're in a situation where they've got to get their parents out of the house in a nursing home, they just need this to, for it to go away. And you happen to make that kind of spread on the backside. Well, who cares? You just help solve the problem for the seller. And that's what matters. So, yeah, there are a lot of people that post that. One thing we don't do, we don't post our numbers on social media whatsoever. We just decided as a company not to do that um, just for personal reasons. But, you know, at the end of the day, if they've solved the problem for a seller, who cares what they make? Hey friends, it's Brady with Carrot, and I just wanted to give you a real quick context about what you're about to listen to. So a few months ago, we had our biggest event of the year, the Carrot Summit, was an online summit for investors and agents, and this was one of the most popular sessions, one of the highest engaging sessions that we had during the whole event. And I feel like this is one of the things that real estate investors and agents can sometimes shy away from. It's not the easiest thing to talk about. And so our whole goal with this conversation on the ethics of wholesaling was to talk about the things that we don't see other people talking about and to shed some light on the people who are doing real estate investing really well, honestly, and ethically, and to highlight those people. And as well as wrestle with some of the questions and topics that are not easy and not black and white to figure out, you know, about how much wholesalers get paid, about regulations, about how to handle sellers. And so this is a session from that Carrot Summit, a big event that we did. And it was so awesome that we're giving it away to you for free. There's no strings attached. And make sure to follow our YouTube channel and subscribe to the podcast so you can catch part two, which will be coming out in a few days of listening to this. And so I hope you enjoy part one and part two and enjoy this episode. Oh, we're here. We're getting to it. What's up, everybody? How are you all doing? Great. What's up? Doing well, thanks. Yeah, excited to be here. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, we'll get the ball rolling here a couple minutes early, but I think we got the crew here. So, uh, as everyone knows here at Carrot, our values are to be a beacon of positivity and pos uh, positivity and possibility, and we are looking to uh, also help business owners have the freedom and impact in their business. And today we're hoping we're going to have an open conversation here with all you great ethical uh, people. We're trying to raise the bar with wholesaling uh, across the industry. And I'm personally excited to get everyone here's opinion on wholesaling. I am a traditional like wholesaler. That's all I do. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have an open dialogue. Uh, we'll see where it goes. I'm excited. And then if you guys have questions, pop them through the chat. And uh, we will get to a large majority of the questions in the last 20 minutes or so. So with that being said, let's get to it. Uh, first question here, we're going to get right into it. Uh, wholesalers get a bad rap. Why do you think that is? And I'll open it up, whoever wants to jump in. All right, I'll go. Oh, no, ladies first. Go ahead. No. Well, I was just going to mention that I think that uh, it gets a bad rep because a lot of times people are uncomfortable about what they're doing and they, it, they approach the sellers kind of uncomfortably in a little, in kind of what a shadier manner because they don't want to tell them that they're wholesaling. So they're not quite sure how to handle that conversation and instead of just being like upfront and, and honest. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's let's do a quick intro. I forgot. Uh, what is wholesaling? Maybe, Adam, you just jumped in here. Can you just give a quick description of what we talk about when we mean wholesaling, what the process looks like? Yeah, wholesaling, you know, is basically where you're uh, working with a seller to um, buy that house. And then at the same time, you're partnering with another in buyer um, and partnering with them on that side. And you're basically putting the two sides together and taking a fee for that. That's wholesaling. Good explanation. Good explanation. And let's do a quick intro around so everyone knows why should we listen to these great people here? Uh, <laughs> let's start with, with Keith. Uh, can you explain like what you do, where you're from, that kind of thing real quick? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Keith Sant, my company's Kind House Buyers. I've been uh, primarily wholesaling for the last five years now. And um, yeah, out of the Tacoma, Seattle area. And I love it. 
Awesome, awesome. Care Camp. He's been to Care Camp like 35 times, I think, at this point <laughs> as well. So I'll be back next month. <laughs> yep. Christina, you want to go? We could go in a circle here. Sure. Yeah. I'm Christina Kudlock. I'm outside of, I'm actually in Phoenix, but I wholesale primarily in the Los Angeles area and have been doing so for the last five, five years or so as well. I'm Lance Doty, uh, one of the home buying guys, I'm the slightly chubbier, slightly taller home buying guy. Uh, we're based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, we, we wholesale actively in Oklahoma City, San Antonio, and, and just launched Austin and Houston this year. Should I go or let Adam go here? I get Adam and Lance are partners, right? So they make I feel sense. like we should be able to high five each other. I know, they, oh, look at that. that. Go. Producing that. on this. <laughs> Top yeah. notch. I'm, I'm the other home buying guy. Hi, everybody. Hi, Christina. I know we. Uh, Hi, Adam. It's, a, it's crazy. It's been a year and a half since that last carrot camp that we were at. So, Great. yeah, it's been wild. Uh, I'm the shorter home buying guy for sure, but definitely uh, the l slightly leaner one. But. Uh, he, yeah, he's been intermittent fasting. He's kind of cheating of late, so he's right. got me. Yeah, it's doing well. Uh, yeah, also in Dallas here. Cool. I'm Eric Stanio. Uh, I'm a hybrid agent investor in the northern Kentucky and Cincinnati area. Um, I've been married 17 years to my wife. We're in Florida right now. My two-year-old is down for a nap. Nice. We're trying to keep everything like on lockdown so if kids run in here. I've got five kids ages 11, nine, six, four, and two. Uh, this is our last day of vacation. And then we're gonna hop in the car tonight and drive all night back to Kentucky, uh, 14 hours, so say a prayer. And uh, yeah, the things I do for Carrot. So, you know, right. this is awesome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Committed on vacation here on the live panel, man. Thanks, thanks for being right. here. <laughs> so let's circle back to the, the first question opening up. Why do wholesalers get a, get a bad rap? Why do why do we even having this discussion in the first place? Christina made made a great comment, but let's let's open it up. Uh, other thoughts? Yeah, I, um, you know, from the agent side, a lot of them think, hey, you know, we can we could better serve these home sellers by putting out on the market, and they just believe that they'll get more money. Um, obviously, that's not always the case. Like people Google how to sell a house without an agent for a reason. They you right. know have a bad taste in their mouth for whatever reason. You know, I get a lot of uh, input from different title companies that don't really appreciate wholesalers uh, just for the sheer fact that they put so many things under contract and they can't close on them. So they add a lot of, you know, stress there. Um, I think I think the biggest thing is some of the newer people that don't understand their market, don't understand the offers that they should be putting it at, and they're not able to fulfill on that offer, um, which then, you know, gives a bad rep. Uh, you know, bad taste in the mouth for the sellers and then word of mouth just kind of goes from there. But it's kind of my two shots. And, and for, for us, you know, I love, Eric, that you introduced yourself as a hybrid, you know, realtor investor, because for us, the reason we're able to kind of establish, uh, uh, kind of buck that trend is, and I think the why wholesalers get a bad rap is because they only, if, if you're not offering an MLS option or if you're a realtor, you're not offering a cash uh, offer, you only have one way to help them. Right. And so you spent money for this lead. You spent 35 minutes in traffic going there. You were hoping it was something that you could fit them into your box. And you and then you realize, hey, I, I need to get this deal. But man, this really should go MLS or man, I, I, I'm a realtor. I really need this to go MLS. But the foundation's in half, you know. And so when, when you don't give the seller options, you have to force them into to a small product category that you offer. Well, then now you've you've compromised your credibility and that happens day in and day out um, with with like you know, Keith mentioned, you know, high offers that people can't close on. Um, you know, that, that that happens all the time. And it's only because, hey, we're in Dallas, Texas here. It's a hot market. Sellers know what th that things are worth. And if you think you know what your house is worth, you know, add 20 to 50 grand in Dallas, Texas right now. You know, and so. Uh, I think it's a lack of options that companies uh, on the wholesale side have if they're not offering uh, the hybrid model. Yeah, and there are some folks out there that use that as their strategy to put houses under contract. They'll go in high knowing they're going to renegotiate that deal and um, and just assume that the sellers will accept their lower offer once they're in the middle of it. And, you know, we fight that all the time. Lance does a really good job of 
uh, basically setting the stage when he knows that other people are going to be making an offer on a house we're looking at. And he'll tell them, hey, you know, you're going to get this. This is what they're going to give you. They're going to come back and renegotiate. And Lance, how many times have we had those people come back to us just in the last six months and say, you're exactly right. That's exactly what they did. They came back, they tried to renegotiate or they just reneged on that price. And will you guys buy this? That happens. We deal with it every single day here. Yep. Just got off the phone with the seller and set that exact scenario. And he he breathed a sigh of relief and he goes, oh, gosh, you know exactly what I'm going through then. He was trying to be guarded. I'm like, dude, I know exactly what you're going. If I'm not your first call, I know what you're going through. So, I've talked to yeah. a lot of investors. Oh, go ahead, Eric. No, oh, yeah, I was going to, you know, to, back to the question, why do we get a bad rep? I, you know, I was thinking about this. I, I certainly had that idea of wholesalers before I got into it five years ago. And I, I would say the reason they get a bad rep, I was thinking about this, is, is probably warranted <laughs> like a lot of the times because there are bad stories. And like my first thought is like, okay, there's a little old lady widow out there with a bunch of equity in her house and somebody's taking advantage of her. Like that's kind of the idea of the industry. Um, and I don't think that's true all the time. And certainly when it dawned on me of like, oh, this is the ethics committee. If, it, if you are a person of ethical and moral characters like you have a you have an opportunity to shine here because let's be honest there are some that there are there's some bad stories out there there's there are people who are trying to take advantage whether it's cramming them down one or whatever you you know and I, I i think there's two reasons for that that i was thinking of um one is a lot of the content that gets a lot of the traction not all the content but it it focuses towards how do you make a lot of money in real estate and it's really hitting on like greed and so you're like attracting a whole industry of people who are like wanting to do the work because, and I'm not saying making money is bad. I like making money, but I do think a lot of the content, whether it's like how to become a great agent or how to become a great wholesaler that can be out there. I've been to a lot of the guru like seminars. It's like you're playing on not one of the best of human traits in my opinion. Uh, and then secondly, there's no filter. There's, there's a very low barrier to entry to get into wholesaling, right? That's why a lot of, like you don't, I didn't have money and I didn't have my real estate license when I started. And that's basically where every wholesaler starts. So there's a very low filter and there's a low barrier of entry. And so why do wholesalers get a bad rep? I, I would, you know, obviously everyone on this panel is like amazing and ethical and would never do anything wrong ever. Uh, but uh, there are some other, you know, uh, not maybe not so ethical people out there. So we got a question here. Uh, I hear wholesalers all the time bragging how about, how about they made 80K, 100K, 300K commission. And how is that serving the client? And I like, yeah, let me just open it up. What do you guys think about this? Honestly, my, uh, my, my biggest commissions that I ever got is, so, is when the seller told me their asking price. And I'm like, whoa, that's way less than I was going to offer. But you know, like, and I've even came up from there. I'd be like, you know what? Like you're asking 75. How would you feel if I gave you 87? You know, cause I know like I'm going to make a lot of money on this. Um, but yeah, like at that point, I feel completely fine. Like if they're asking a price and I'm able to fulfill that and make money, heck yeah. Well, and it's not always about the money. I mean, it is when you see it when a wholesaler puts it out there. But if you've handled that situation for a seller, you know, you don't know what they're going through. So if they're in a situation where they've got to get their parents out of the house in a nursing home, they just need this to, for it to go away. And you happen to make that kind of spread on the backside. Well, who cares? You just help solve the problem for the seller. And that's what matters. So yeah, there are a lot of people that post that. One thing we don't do, we don't post our numbers on social media whatsoever. We just decided as a company not to do that um, just for personal reasons. But you know, at the end of the day, if they've solved a problem for a seller, who cares what they make? Yep. And you know, one thing we explain, of course, we're, we are hybrid and, and we try to use that to separate ourselves because when people when people Google us, we're, we're usually competing against iBuyers, right? And, and cash buyers. So we try to really separate ourselves early in the first conversation. And one of the things I really like to, to let people know is, look, guys, there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you would sell your house cash. But for the most part, there's two main ones. And that's in your, you're in financial distress. Something has to happen in the next seven to 10 business days. We can step in. 
or the property is in ear repair and no one that's responsible for the property has the means to, to, to get it out of that ear repair. If it's any other scenario than those two, we would love to, to work with you and help you get down the road, you know, uh, to, to Anna's question right there. They seem to forget about helping sellers and being a solution for them. And that is, that is our motto, buying, selling, helping, you know, and I, I probably turn away more deals than I sign, a, than, than we close a year. And it's because maybe I'm too honest, but if I was that seller's brother or I was, you know, their counsel, I'm going to tell them, here's, here's what it looks like, you know? And it's real easy to hang up with me and be like, dude, that that's right. And then the next guy calls and just offers 45 grand over, then spends the next four and a half weeks renegotiating and renegotiating them down to where I was at. And I probably lose that deal because I wasn't willing to, to mislead and re renegotiate. But, but man, it's all about putting that, uh, the puzzle together, of, uh, helping the, the seller accomplish their goals. And sometimes we've had some big, we've had some big, uh, um, commissions like that, not, not in the three hundreds, but close to a hundred. And, you know, one time was a scenario, we had no clue. There was a niche market inside the comp that the comps wasn't showing, you know, and the seller, we, we were able to come to agreement there. So, uh, but we, we're very straightforward as, as, as to when you should take a cash offer. And if you don't meet those that criteria, we would love to talk to you about our no stress MLS product. We'd love to talk to you about the construction crews that we have. We'd love to talk to you about creative financing and, and just it's just but it starts with what they need. Where do you guys think is the line, though? And I struggle with this when I make offers of like, OK, do we say I'm a wholesaler? My business will make enough money if I make 10 grand on a deal or do you go out there trying to maximize profit? Because as you know, let's say I could make 40 grand on a deal and I and I chose to make 20 and then maybe the next two deals I have fall apart. I'm like, well, I'm actually I'm actually going to go out of business potentially, you know, or things like that. So where where is the line of how much do you offer? Do you try to make as much as possible? I, I just did a wholesale. We made 90 grand last year. We could have made 50 on it. So like I, I, I even struggle with yeah, what the yeah, line yeah. should be. I think it's a really good question because it it is about helping people and it's about making money for yourself. <laughs> like you're, you're actually kind of you're trying to do both. And so I take a long term perspective with this. Uh, I'll never do a cash offer wholesale deal unless it's a win win situation, unless that person is really what they want. Um, like like uh, Adam and Lance are saying here. Um, there's a, you know, there, there's, so if we, for me, this is this, I, I go from a faith standpoint here. So there's a verse in Acts where Paul says, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that's kind of like my guideline. I'm like, can I do this deal and, and feel that my conscience is clear? <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it, it's difficult because I do have two competing. Uh, there's two interest. competing factors here. Yeah. Interest. There's, there's helping this a, a person solve a problem, which I think if you do a win-win deal, you're doing that. And there's also like, I got to send my five kids to college. <laughs> um, and so I, I do want to be actually shrewd as a snake if I'm putting that hat on. The way I've been able to reconcile this in my mind is doing what uh, what Adam and Lance are doing is I walk in and I, I, I just, I'm completely honest with everything. So the way I do my offers, I'll bring a net sheet that literally has two different brandings of my carrot sites. One is the like, we buy houses and I need to do a better job of blending these branding. But, and the other is the agent side, the team Stanio. And I'll run the net sheet on both. And the way I do my offers is say, hey, look, there's there's really three factors here. There's how, there's, there's how much money you're gonna make, there's, how, there's speed and there's hassle. And so I just say, look, let's say there's the cash offer. This is option A. This is gonna be the fastest, the easiest, but the, and it's going to be the least amount of money. And I just tell them because I want to make a profit and every, any investor you talk to is going to want to make a profit. I've never had anyone in all of the appointments I've ever done say, well, I can't believe you want to make a profit. Like every single person who has done any, who's calling you for a cash offer understands that it's, they're like, yeah, it's a business. I get it. So I, I say, here's option A. And then I say, and here's option C, which is, this is what most people do. Traditionally, you list it with an agent, you, you put money into it, you fix it up. This one, you're going to get the most amount of money even after you pay your real estate commission. Uh, but it's going to be the most amount of work and the longest because you got to do the things. And I said, but and then the, what might work for you is option B, which is in the middle, 
which is uh, you can kind of, you might do a few things or you could list it as is. You're still gonna pay the, the real estate commissions, but you don't have to account for the profit that the investor wants to make on the flip. The repairs are the same either way, the repairs and updates. So that, that money is the same. And then I literally pull out my net sheet and show them the numbers that backs up everything I just said. And the only difference between the two numbers is the profit that I wanna make. So I like, I am just completely upfront with them. And then I'm like, look, do whatever you want. And I will often actually try to encourage people to list it. I'm like, look, I know you want a cash offer and I make more money doing this. So don't get me wrong. I'd like to do this as well, but I think it's in your best interest to list the home on the market in this market. You're going to sell it. Even, you know, even though it needs some work, you're going to sell it in a, less than a week and you're going to net 20 grand more. And, and then I let, I will have actually, I'll make people push back on me. Like, no, I really want the cash offer. Absolutely. Um, and, and the way, so what happens at the end of that is you have, you're at the closing table and people are happy. Like they actually got what they want. And so for me, when I'm thinking like about my business, it's not just about how much money I make on the deal. It's like, are they going to leave me a video testimonial and a five-star review? And they're going to be smiling and shaking my hand and saying, thank you. That's what I want. Like at the end of every single deal. Yeah. And Eric, you said it right. You, you basically gave them options, let them decide. And we kind of do it the same way with less sort of, we don't really put all the numbers out there first, but we'll give them, you know, those same options. Do you want option A, you want option B, or do you want option C? And you decide and you tell us which way you want to go. And then we'll figure out what we make on the back end. I mean, in the last six months, we've made it, we've, we've had one deal we made $2,000 on, and we've had one we've made almost a hundred on. And so, you know, we just sort of let them dictate it. And then we figure out how we make money for our company on the backside. And, that that allows us to sleep good at night and we're we're comfortable there and 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 it's up to our team to figure out how to make money so that we don't go out of business and that's sort of our approach how do you guys decide how much money you want to make on a property eric said you know okay well i I figure out how much money i want to make but how do we decide how much money we want to make and i want to throw it over to christina first and hear what she has to say about this and we'll then we'll go around yeah, when we calculate our offers, we we uh, figure in a 20K assignment fee in LA. So it's not to say that we won't go down from that or we can't come up from that, but that's when we are initially running our numbers, we do it based off of 20K. Yeah. You know, and I, I had a scenario on Friday uh, last week, we purchased a home in Sherman, Texas. And you know, this is a real unique situation. ARV is 200 grand. Well, I should say it's like 250. It's a duplex. It's 100 years old. It needs every bit of 100,000 in work. And I, I, one of my little tricks that I like to do is, first off, I walk in with a business card and a cell phone in my back pocket. There's no clipboard. I'm not Zillow. I'm not here to turn all the knobs. I could care less about your new fan, you know. But if you, if you love it, I'm going to tell you it's the coolest fan I've ever seen in my life. And we're going to talk about it. But uh but, you know, as I read my math for him, I showed him, you know, my offer is closer to 70, 75, right? And I'm just, and, and I know he's bought this property for 65 grand three years prior, and he needs about another 25 on top of he, what the return he would like to have to get to the next step. Okay. So I know he needs 95 to get there. That does not fit into my math at all. I mean, if you show, if I follow realtor math one-on-one, I'm losing 25 grand here, Right. But this is a great property. This is a, it's a tick away from the, the downtown square. It's a duplex. So it, there's, there's five strategies that I can rattle off right now of ways someone can make some money. And so I explained to him, I said, look, man, if I'm shooting you straight, you know, I'm going to offer 70. I said, but that doesn't help me create, you know, a, a, a lifelong customer in you if I just give you what I need the house for. That doesn't make me, you know, someone that, that an authority in the space, someone that really changes your life. And so I was like, here's what we can do. You need 95 because he wants to go buy a mobile home on four acres outside of town. I was like, let's start there. I said, give me a 15, give me a two week option. OK, and if I can't get not if I can't find a way to make profit at 95, then we're going to talk again. I said, man, I may need to get closer to 70. And if we, and if I if I can't get anywhere close to a number that works for you, then you need to stay put and let the market mature another year. But I just let's start with your number. Right. And I think a lot of people get so concerned with their profits and what they need in, instead of the client. And and to us, it's all about the relationship. And I'll bring it back to your initial question. How do you decide how much money to make and when? 
to us, the answer is always the relationship. And in that case, that story I just gave you is the relationship with the seller, right? I want to knock it out of the park for him. You know, he's been trying to rehab this house. He bought it for 65 grand. The markets have matured. He should make a little bit of money and get down the road. I'm going to do my best with who I know and what we do to try to make that offer work for him and for me. But the other side of it is when, and Christina mentioned having a 20K barrier. That's very close to where we're at here in Dallas as well. We start there. But if, if I know I can make 45, if I have a showing and bleed all my buyers dry and have them bid each other up, I would rather make 35 or 25 or 20 and give it to a pocket deal, give that pocket deal to a guy that I know is going to buy 10 more houses from me one day, right? I'm only as good as my buyers. So I could give two rips about an extra 10, 15, 20K, 2K, whatever it is in a scenario of, do I want to make the most money every time? Absolutely. But I want to build a relationship every time ahead of that. And it's, it's sometimes it's great. We just we did a behind the deal on the win, win, win uh, deal we had in Van Alstine where we, we helped the seller. We helped the buyer. We helped the neighbors. It was awesome. And we made a ton of money. But sometimes it is, you know, the seller has their price. Here's where I can move it. Man, I haven't sold this guy a deal in a while. He's really he's 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 a good guy. He took care of me when I was only doing ten deals a year. You know, let let's let him have it for his number, and he'll we'll, we'll get it we'll, we'll get it back on the next one. But the answer is always the relationship. Keith, Eric, how do you guys determine how much money you need to make on a deal? It you know it depends, right? If I know uh, like uh, I'd like to make twenty on every deal. Some some deals I only make like ten. Um, it, you know, really depends if I hear like, hey, we're getting multiple offers, you know, these, these different things, I'm probably going to offer a little higher so I could be more competitive. Um, and then I'm shooting for like 10 ish. But uh, yeah, I'm usually around that 10 to 20 range. Yeah, for me, it, the seller definitely dictates it a lot of the times, um, you know, what they have in it, what they need to get out of it is certainly a big part of it, but I, I will, I typically am using that 70 or 75% rule from the ARV and then backing out the repairs. And again, I put that right on the paper of the net sheet. Uh, I'm not doing as much wholesaling uh, now, like the, the cash offers I'm doing, I'm buying the properties and flipping them. And so I'm, um, it's not just a wholesale fee I need to get. I'm, I'm thinking right. about, you know, what I'm putting into it and the flip. Um, and so, um, and if, if it doesn't work for me, then I just say, sorry, it's not the one for me. And I walk away and I let somebody else, if somebody else wants to do it and make like 15 on it for me at this point where my business is, I'm like, that's not actually worth it. Cause I want to make 30. I usually tell them like 30, I want to make at least 30 plus for my time and effort and, and putting out my capital and risk. Um, so, uh, and sometimes they call back, you know, <laughs> like if they can't get the deal from someone else. Um, but I, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with that. What's so Eric, funny. What's funny about your question though, Tim, is you mentioned you're like you're like, what if you know you haven't had a deal in a while and you're on the you know that has never been our our, our problem. Our problem is when we're on like we're you know we know our KPIs so well, right? So when when we know we're, we we close a deal out of every ten leads and it's been like we're on like lead twenty seven. I'm like, okay, I've got to get the next three appointments. They have to be, I get that desperate on our KPIs, but not, you know, not necessarily on, on, you know, the business going out or, or worrying about us on that. So I just thought that was, was funny. You mentioned that. Those are our longer meetings when that's the case, by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you guys change your um, parameters? And it's, it's goes to like flipping as well. Like it, it sounds like, okay, Eric, if you're trying to make 30 on a deal, but let's say you, you you get a deal and it turns out to be a nightmare deal and you make zero or you lose 30 on it. Do you go into the next deal being like, OK, I'm still going to try to make 30 or to Adam and Lance's point of, OK, well, you, we know we get a deal every 10 leads, but it's been 27 leads. And we don't get a deal. Do you adjust those profit parameters or are you just like trust that we have this number we want to hit? It'll all work out in the long run. Yeah, you just got to trust the numbers. We we and I preach this to our team. You know, the, we're we're basically growing the business with the numbers and the math and not emotion. And that's sometimes hard to do, especially when you see those those leads coming in and we're not closing a deal every once in a while and it grows and grows. And then, you you know, it all ends up coming back into balance if you're doing the right thing. So, you know, we just stay focused on on what we know works and and trust in the process. And it all usually works out. It just may not work out 
you know, within a short period of time. But if you look at a longer period of time and, and, and run your KPI, KPIs consistently that way, then, you know, usually things work out pretty good. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. I, I try not to even think about any numbers when I walk into an appointment. I'm just there to, Absolutely. you know, as a wholesaler, like from the wholesaling perspective, like you're a problem solver, right? Yep. Like if you're helping sellers that have a problem and yep. if they don't have a problem, I shouldn't be there or I should be offering a different solution to them. Absolutely. Right? Like, because I'm not going to just try to sh uh, like shove a cash offer down every single leads throat because it's not, you know, it's not going to make me look good and it's not the right thing for the sellers. So okay, I tell so people a lot of time, like, Hey, you know, I'm here to buy a house. Like I buy houses. I could give you an offer now, but you're not going to like it. And I would not suggest you take it. Like you're going to be better served by a good agent. Right. And if you, you know, and when I say good agent, I mean, someone that's going to, you know, negotiate hard on your behalf, you know, knows the market, knows how to market, you know, so in, everyone, you know, you get your license with a, 90 hour class and you know in two weeks and then one test but uh you know getting a rockstar agent is different you know if you want a rockstar agent like one that i use to list my houses i'd be happy to uh, introduce you guys yeah so let's say keith we have a situation where it is like the quintessential like old lady she, it's, she wants to get rid of her home she's moving in with her family or whatever and let's say the home is worth 200k and she owns it outright the home's in good condition and she is completely happy selling it for 100k or 50k like she'll take either one and both will solve her problem both like need to be sold to an investor the home needs to be fixed up or whatnot do you try to offer as much as you possibly can or kind of like do you try to make as much as you can as long as the seller is happy Does that makes sense I, it'd be somewhere in the middle there. Like, I mean, I want them to be happy, but at the same time, I don't want to take advantage of people. I want someone, you know, like Eric said, I want people to be happy that they did business with me, not like seller's remorse later, not bad mouthing me. Like I get a lot of referrals. I got a nut one a couple of days ago, an agent reached out to me because another agent that I guess I've done a deal with before told them that I'm a, I'm a good person for their client. And, you know, so I'm going on, you know, you don't get those kind of referrals and that kind of reputation by taking advantage or, you know, making the most out of every single lead. Um, so in the long run, like it pays for itself. Yeah, I make less per deal than some of these other guys, but, you know, I'm building a reputation. Gotcha. Great answer. And it kind of goes to Christina, like the 20K kind of target you have. Where does that come from? Is that like oh, this is just like what I need to sleep at night. I don't want to try to get 80K or is it part of the market or how do you determine that number? Yeah, it's kind of part of the market. I mean, at Los Angeles is a higher dollar market than most most other markets. So it comes from that and just knowing our cost per lead and stuff and what, you know, all feeds into it. But we do, I mean, not every deal we do is 20K. We've done deals for 5K. We've done deals for, um, and deals for more than eight, uh, 20k but it's kind of the same as what Keith was saying like all of our biggest deals have come from people giving us their price and us actually even paying more than what they were asking just because we knew it was going to be a fat fee and we really did want to not take in a, take advantage of anyone and make it feel like it was still a win-win for them not just taking advantage of someone who doesn't quite understand the market. And, and to what uh, you know, Keith mentioned earlier, there's a reason people are Googling how to sell a house without an agent, right? Well, the way that kind of burns us sometimes, if I'm not careful, I've had to learn this because we, you know, we started the hybrid two years ago. We got really good at it last year. And we're, we're killing it uh, right now. Um, but people are calling me to not use the realtor, right? And they, it's usually their brother-in-law. It's usually their son-in-law. It's like, I, the la I want to cash out of this house, but I'm not giving a dime to that dude and or their industry. I mean, it, they're, they're passionate about not using a realtor. And so what I've had to learn in the hybrid model is even though, yes, I'm showing that lady, Tim, a way that she can sell her house for top market value, she's already gone down that path. Her family is like, we are not showing this house. We don't want, uh, and so I've had to, I've had to almost back off. Like I have to read the room a little bit to say, yes, I do have this great hybrid model. Where you can net 30 to 40 K more, 
but you've probably called, I, I have to remember, they called me for a reason, right? And so, uh, you know, ma'am, here, we'd love to, you know, buy this. And, and, and in that scenario, we would just offer the max. I mean, and unless, you know, I mean, we're going to be, we, we, we're in Dallas. We're so, it's so competitive. Even people that are calling us that only call the home buying guys know the value of their dang home. If you don't know the value of your home from a Zestimate that you saw on a billboard or something, I mean, everyone thinks they're a realtor anyways. So we're, we're not, there's not too many fleecing folks on what the market value of properties are these days. It's the lead story in every news. Um, you know, so there's that, that conundrum doesn't come up where we're, we're offering someone yeah, 30 I, grand and the house is worth 300. It's just not. I'm about to say, Tim, where is this hypothetical situation where someone <laughs> yeah, just yeah, wants to give 50 grand for free? Because I actually will sign up for that. Uh, yeah. I, you 50 works for you instead of a hundred. Okay. We'll do 50. Like, I, don't, I mean, Hey, yeah. Uh, I will take that. But like to what we said before, I've already showed them. Yeah. Anyone's looking up the Zestimate. I'm literally showing them as an agent. Like you could net this much. Are you sure you like, I won't do that unless people are like, yes, I want to do this because of X reason. Sometimes they don't give you that reason up at first. They might give you a reason. And then as you build a little bit more trust, a little bit more rapport, you realize like what the real reason is that they don't want to list it on the market. Um, this happened to me the other day. I just bought one. And at first I was like, yeah, there's repairs. I don't want to fix it up. There's maybe mold in the basement. I don't know what to do with that. And then like later on, it was like, it was an emotional issue of like, I don't want my neighbors seeing how I've been living, you know? And I'm just like, oh, that's a different thing completely, right. you know? And that's a, you know, there's shame and or whatever, like embarrassment. Um, and she had this other house that her mom was giving her. And she's like, I just, I would like to go this route. Um, and it's like, okay, yeah, I get that. But that's not that's not the first thing they lead with mm -hmm. on your lead carrot lead form or the phone call or even the first, you know, 20 minutes of the appointment. So um, but yeah, given your scenario, I will uh, profit the extra 50k. And Eric, and that's what you have to do as as newer wholesalers out there, you've got to find that motivation that you just mentioned. That's what it's all about. That's why people get paid to do what they do in this business as wholesalers is finding that motivation. However you get to it, that's, that's what pays and it pays pretty well, but that's what you got to find. Yep. You got to find the underlining motivation for why they want to sell. And that, man, that's a good one. You know, you just don't want the neighbors to, you don't want to be embarrassed by what your house looks like. And there's a lot of bad houses out there and the way people keep them. And that's, that's where you pay money. And it really, you know, that it comes back to this is we're only, you know, we we pro, we're going to make as much as uh, as much value as we provide to the sellers. And we, we had a good example of something we're doing recently or, or doing here lately. You know, we're, we're taking on listings, but we're also doing the repair work ourselves with our own contractors. Well, we're just adding more value to that seller. We had a, a seller who had a had a house here in Dallas. She lived in she lived five hours away. Uh, her brother lived in the house. It was not kept up well. She was ready to sell it. She d finally convinced him to, to move out. So we got that done. She said, okay, I want to look at a cash offer, but you know uh, that, that's the way I want to go because I'm not here. I can't deal with this house. I can't do the repairs. So we came in, we made her an offer. We were 40 grand lower than the next guy. The next guy she signed the deal with, he backed out. She came back to us and said, hey guys, what can you do? We said, let's, let's do this. We'll list the house for you. It's vacant. We'll handle all the repairs. We'll sell it for you. You will make more than you would have made with that cash offer with the other company and everything works out. Exactly what we did. So we spent 16 grand in doing the repairs. We sold it. She made, uh, what she made, 15,000 more than uh, she would have made on that cash offer, Lance. Yep, yep. And she didn't have to come to the house. She didn't have to deal with the repairs. She just went to closing and was done. And so we provided you know, significantly more value to her than just being a standard realtor. And that, and then obviously we made some money on the repairs as well. We marked all that up. So that ended up bumping our fee up like 20% and everybody's happy. So yep. it's all about what kind of value you can provide to the sellers at the end of the day. So in that instance, you were the realtor and the contractor Absolutely. and you made money with those two. We solutions. made money with both. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, this is the situation that happened to me. I was mentioning that 90 K wholesale deal. I did. And I'd, I'd love to know your guys' thoughts on it. Um, and th this probably will never happen again, but um, we had a seller call us and they were asking 250 uh, for their property. And we ran the numbers 
and we um i forget what the arv we determined but basically we offered her 160 on it like we thought 250 was super high she ended up accepting on accepting it um and then we when we blasted it out uh turns out we grossly underestimated the arv and the offers that were coming in were actually 250 for for cash buyers they were exactly the same as what she was asking for but now we had a 90k spread so we ended up taking the 90k spread there but i'm curious to think do you, do you guys think or have you, even anyone in the comments was that unethical to do do you think at that point we should have raised our offer for the seller the seller was still happy we ended up like buying it we didn't just assign it um but i'm curious that kind of situation does that happen to you and, and what are your thoughts there yeah i mean seller's happy i i I'd, yeah. I'd leave it yeah. you know i've jumped up a little higher than they're asking when i knew that they were going to get multiple offers too like but it, if I went higher than they're asking, because just getting them to sign the purchase and sale agreement is just one thing. You still got to get them to the closing. And what's the first thing a seller does after they sign an agreement with you? They call their brother, their family member, you know, mm -hmm. their cousin. Hey, guess what? I just sold my house. What's their first question? How much do you sell it for? And then they're like, what? Why did you do that? Yeah. I would have bought it. Blah, blah, blah. And now they're trying to you know, back out. Like if you, if you don't build that rapport, like and offering a little more than they're asking says volumes about who you are and building rapport so our, our current flip right now is in uh, bishop arch district of dallas and um you know the seller was walking the the, the mother had passed there's a reverse mortgage the, the kids did not know how to handle the reverse mortgage get the payoff they, it was just it was just a mess so they were just gonna let it go um, one of the ladies that uh, met us at one of our meetups that had this lead. So she's like, will you go run it with me? I was like, absolutely. And we go and, the, you know, I mean, we, we could have, you know, the house, I think they owed like 120 on the, on the payoff and we could have got it for 120. And, and, but I, exactly that scenario, Keith, and there was multiple heirs involved and that always happens that you sold it for what? Like, even though no, you know, the brother-in-law never has an opinion until there's a contract signed then they call you back the next night. Right. And so I said, well, how many heirs are there? They said five. I said, well, why don't we make sure everyone gets like four grand? And I'm like, I mean, surely that helps everybody, right? And they're like, what do you mean you're going to pay? You know, I'm like, well, I'll make my offer to where, you know, there's an extra 20 grand you guys can split evenly. And so, you know, that's, and that's just me, you know, we still, that put me like right at where I should have bought it. I could have, I could have had an extra $20,000 kicker, but we're going to flip this one. The upside on, on, on what a flip that, that we produce has is is pennies compared to offering an extra 20 grand on a property i mean to buy something in dallas at the hundred and thirty thousand dollar range is, is awesome you know so yeah it's just and it's just little nuggets like that but that also offset that, ob that objection that later as they were going through all the errors that evening uh you know i knew i could with five grand you know kind of keep everybody happy um but i didn't have to offer that you know yeah not to mention we paid the lady that brought us that lead and now she's going man this is working out good here's another one guys here's yeah. another one here's she sent us two other new leads already and so yeah she you know, got five grand building, too yeah we're, we're kind of building those bird dogs that way and and she doesn't have to know how to do all of the steps so she you know she has kind of a niche in this one little pocket of town where she can she just knows people and knows who wants to sell and and uh, she's bringing them to us. So it's, you know, it's a win, win, win for everybody. I mean, everybody's, everybody's, you know, benefiting from that in, in some way. And it, it, uh, it's a long-term deal. I mean, if we're trying to just skin the cat on every one of these deals, then, you know, those people are not going to be as likely to, to refer us to their neighbors and their friends. And, you know, Lance runs into these sellers around town. He runs into them at <laughs> baseball games and football games. And so we're, you know, we're, we're not going to jeopardize our integrity or our name uh, you know, just to make an extra bit of money on these deals because we're out and about, this is where we live. This is where we work and, and we're going to run into these people. And, you know, these people, these sellers over the last, you know, four or five years are referring us, uh, deals. That's a, that's become a really, really big part of our deal flow. And so that, that's something that we don't want to jeopardize. So, uh, we're going to open up to some questions here in a bit. So anyone who's listening, post your juicy questions. We'll get to them. But first, I want to talk about transparency. You can't talk about ethics without talking about transparency with the, the sellers and with the buyers. Let's start with the seller side first. How transparent are you with the sellers um, with, you know, all the numbers you're calculating? Are you wholesaling or not? Like how, how transparent are you guys? Curious. Yeah, I feel we, like we should are, give Christina a chance. We've been yeah, talking ahead, over Christina. Christina. 
do it. So yeah, it kind of depends on the person that we're talking to. There's some people where they're, they don't care so much about all of the numbers and they're not, it, you could tell that they're the kind of person that might get overwhelmed with too much information. And so in that case, we don't necessarily break down the numbers for everyone, but I mean, with most of the people that we work with showing comps and showing people what prices are selling for, what other cash sales are, are selling for, and then, you know, working the numbers with them that way can be really helpful, especially, um, can even work in your favor too. As if there's a lot of times people have inflated values of what they think that their property is worth. And so just spending the extra time with them and showing them, showing them the numbers and showing them what stuff is selling for can, um, can actually help you too. It, it, transparency is so hard because, and here's why it's hard. And this is the ethical, this is the complete ethical dilemma of, of a wholesaler, right? We thrive off gaining uh, control of properties and that starts with a contract, right? Well, if you just, I mean, it's so easy to get a property under contract when people are calling and asking for an offer, you know? So, but uh, it takes one extra conversation that can rock the boat completely. If you, uh, if you, if you, if you don't explain how wholesaling works well enough and why you need access and why a showing may be involved and why an option period is involved, all of those things, you know, so yeah, yes, ma'am, why don't we just do this? And you just complete, keep them completely in the dark. You get a contract that night, you go home, families, you know, the kids are high-fiving you, your business partner thinks you're the greatest, awesome, right? But you know, deep down, that lady has no clue I'm wholesaling it. I don't have any access to it. I'm pretty sure I overbid it. And, you know, this is this is a three-day delayed letdown, right? Whenever that option period's up. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to speak too much because there's so many great panelists here, but I, we just closed one last Friday. And this, 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 is, this house was in a part of the of, of South Dallas that not a lot of people are buying in. So our, our buyer pool was really small, but she, and she loved me. She had a little dog grooming business but running out of her house. She actually kept the house in really great shape. There's not a lot of comps because lack of inventory in Dallas. There's just not a lot of data right now. I didn't know where to offer her, but she had two offers on the coffee table. And she, when, when she, I kind of won her over, she showed me, boom, here's two offers. One was for 200,000, uh, uh, one was, was from 215. I was prepared to offer like 172. Okay. And I saw I'm like, wow, we're far apart. But let, the 215 offer, I, I, that was like a Microsoft Word contract. I was like, this is junk. So, but the other one, the 200 offer was a legit offer from a very legit competitor of, competitor of mine. Uh, and truth be told, I had prepared for a 170 offer, but I really hadn't ran comps myself or talked about it with my team. I was just kind of stopping in at this appointment. Long story short, I went into why I, I basically told her, I'll do 2025, give her an extra 2,500 bucks. But I said, but here's the thing. I want you to work with me. And she's like, well, what does that mean? I was like, well, let me explain how wholesaling works. So I was like, this is a good offer at 200. I think it's extremely too high. But if one of my legit competitors is willing to pay you that, instead of me trying to negotiate you down, I would rather honor that and see if I can perform what they're claiming they can perform. And so what I need from you is I'm going to need a seven day option. I'm going to need access to the house. And if, if one of my buyers that on my buyers list loves this property for every dollar over 2025, that's my profit. And you get that number. She's like, that sounds great for me. Go do it. And I'm like, but hold on. I was like, I don't think I can get that number. I was like, I'm just working with you on, on your number. And I think this, this offer is high. I said, if I don't get any traction, if I can't get folks out here, if their comps don't show the data necessary for an investor to, to invest at that price, we're going to have to go down closer to my side, which was 170. Long story short, uh, about a, I did a two week option. I couldn't get nobody there. I, I partnered with folks. We couldn't get anyone there at the original offer. So I called her and I said, look, I said, here's the thing. I, I think I, I did get one lady there. She beat me up on it. And it, it, long story short, I needed the house at 170. So I called her and told her, I said, look, you know, here's where we need to be. This is where the offer should have been in the beginning. I, we worked it for two weeks your way. Now we got to do it my way. And I said, but if we do it my way, we can get it done. I will need to do another showings. I don't have anyone on the hook. Very transparent, right? Uh, and she was like, you know what? She said, uh, give me an hour. I'm going to go through your reviews. She called me back an hour later. And she said, there's not one person that was unhappy with an offer you made, not seeing an offer through. And she, we, I reneg renegotiated her down $32,500. Um, I was able to move that deal for $175,000 because that was the true number. I made $5,000. Uh, but that is a complete win of transparency. 
Um, and it's hard, you know, I mean, I, that was a month, it was the middle of February. We signed that contract. January is, is what we call national snow skiing month because we never do any deals in January for some reason. So we were coming off of January and we needed a deal. And so I was like, I'll match this, you know? And so, you know, but it only worked because I was transparent, you know, uh, don't go out to dinner yet. Let's get out of the option period. As I always tell the sellers. So. Well, and the, and the thing about, you know, the iBuyers sort of being so public here lately with Zillow and, and Open Door and these other folks is that they're, they're sort of making our wholesaling industry mainstream. And so there are more people now that know about this industry than ever. So it's actually easier now today to explain and be transparent with what it means to wholesale than it was when we started, you know, six and a half years ago. Um you know, back then people didn't know what it was and it was still sort of a, a shadow industry where we're, you know, just just sort of, uh, you know, dodging, you know, traditional real estate people. And so it, it's much easier today to explain what it is and, and show them uh, uh, the numbers and show them the process than it ever was. So every, everybody needs to do that. That's that's how we improve the name of wholesaling as a whole uh, is by everybody doing it the same way. Can, can I go back, Tim, to your, sorry for my tech issues and whatever. <laughs> You're good. <man. laughs> my bad. Um, so uh, the example you said where you got it for like 90 or whatever less than you sh should have got it and then realized yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I do think, you know, and again, I, I keep banging the same drum, but the, you know, being able to share as your hybrid and options is valuable when I'm doing that and I'm being transparent about it, I'm also saying I'm, I'm wearing two different hats when I walk into that. You know, I am, I'm Mr. Investor over here who wants to make money or I'm Mr. Agent who's trying to get you the most amount of money possible. And I'll literally say to people in the appointment, like these are different hats. And there is, there is a fiduciary responsibility when you're an agent that you don't have when you're a wholesaler right. necessarily. Now I know we're talking about another level of ethics, but Tech, I, I guess depending on the laws of your state, I don't know every state, but tech in our in our state, there that person has their own agency, and so I think Tim, it would in that scenario, that that's an interesting one that you brought up. Like you're like, ooh, this is this is weird. Like I just made ninety grand more than I should have made, or something on that. Part. Like that is a really, I don't know. You know, I I may have done something. I, I probably would have still done the deal, but I might have given them another uh crack at it or to say like hey i just i don't know that that's a really that's an interesting one that's a pretty rare one um but I, again going back to, to your second question here about the transparency um this is why i i love being able to show them the numbers like I, I bring the comps i say you could sell this as is right now for this and you'll net this i know it i'll put the sign in today in the yard and it'll be like it'll be under contract because they're in this market anyway like any buyer is going to look at this as a deal because they'll put in the sweat equity that you don't have to put in because you don't want to do that because you're busy and you have whatever problems in your life, you know, and um, it'll it'll go and you'll net this much more. And unless they like turn that away, except Christina brought up a good point, like some people don't even want to have that discussion. And in that scenario, I won't show them the net sheet if they're like, no, I just want the cash offer. Like whatever, like some are like just so motivated and they're like, I understand it's less. I don't care about the comps like. That happens occasionally too, mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think I, I think we're all kind of saying the same thing. Like you want, you want, um, you want to be thinking long term for your business. You want to have. I, I can't tell you how many deals I win because people have gone and looked at my Google reviews and said every single person was happy. You know, they're all five yeah. star. I, I had a. Um, I did write down this story for this this call. I had a guy. Uh, call me early last year. He was living in a a model home from the '90s, and so there was like the what the duck wallpaper, like all the like nice everything you could think of, like all the original model furniture was still in the home, and he was living there. And uh, he called me. He had read the reviews. He's like, I just and I showed him both numbers. Like, look, you can list this as is right now and make this much more. Or I'll give you this offer for 190, and I think I said you could list it for probably like 230, something like that. Um, and he's like, "No, I'm good with the cash offer." He had had a, uh, a divorce, and he was living in the house where they had lived. And he's like, "I just 
like the mental space. I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I don't care how long it takes. We did the deal. Um, I, I did very like I sold the model furniture on like Facebook Marketplace, and like um, painted it and put in new carpets. And I sold it for like two eighty five, like a couple of weeks later. Um, and and then so that deal was great. Made a lot of money. I think that was the best deal I had done up until that point. I made around I think seventy on it, something like that. Same guy, and he was thanking me at the closing table. Same guy calls me up nine months later. He's living uh, now with his new girlfriend. Her house has a that she owns has a foundation issue, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, I know the guy," and and like he called me. He's and like I come to her house, and he's like, "This is the guy who helped me out." He was like crazy, <laughs> and like he couldn't wait for me to be introduced. Or I'm like, "This is this is a little over the top," but like. I'm like, I just helped you sell a house. You know, I didn't change your whole life. He's like, no, you're amazing. And, and I ended up, we worked out a deal on that one and I bought the house and um, I ended up just selling it as is on the market. I fixed the foundation issue is like, I don't know, 15 grand into it. I made another like 50 plus on that house selling it as is after that one closes, he calls me and says, Hey, we're getting married. We want to buy a house. Can you be our agent? And they're like shopping in a million dollar range. I'm like, yes, yes, I can do that for you. <laughs> Absolutely. But like that story just still blows my mind of like, um, I made a lot of money off of this guy and he was, and he was thankful both times, like, yep. uh, uh, like extra thankful and then wants me to be his agent again. And, and so, and this is just, we're a few years into the business, but I, for me, like, I, um, I want to bring my kids into the business too. So I'm thinking like 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I'm thinking of how many Google reviews I'll have or whatever the review thing is then, you know, <laughs> but I'm thinking about my actual name in my city. Like, and what, what is that worth? Like, what is right. the reputation worth to Absolutely. pass on a business, whether it's to my kids or somebody else that is to me so much more valuable than to your earlier question, like how much more profit can I squeeze out of this deal now? And I think that's what Lance and Adam are saying too. Like the relationships long-term are, are just so incredibly valuable. Um, yeah. Treat people right and give them however you want to do that, whether that's, you know, and whatever options you have at your disposal, but treat people um, the way you would want to be treated. Right. And so the thing, we'll and real quick, guys, th this industry is difficult. You know, everybody posts the 50 and $80,000 wholesale fees and all that. You know, what you don't see is you don't see us working on Saturday nights and Sundays and, you know, 30 days in a row and, you know, taking calls like Lance when you're on a date night and you have to just cut bait and go to an appointment. You know, you guys, the, those people out there don't see all that work. This is not an easy business. This is not a... This is not a an easy job and an easy you know role to fill, and so you know you, you talk about that time that you know those those types of values you provide, Eric, and you should be paid well for that, man. You did a lot of stuff for those people, and it's not easy. And there's a lot to it that just that goes into it besides the part that you see, which is the money at the end. And you know, so people that are getting into this that are new and, and have never done this, you know, hey you know, watch our Instagram and you'll see me posting, you know, Saturday mornings and I'm running, you know, lumber to a flip and, you know, Sunday afternoon, Lance has to leave his kids and go to an appointment. You know, th there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into this business as well that, you know, that, that is, is warranted for the type of rewards there are, if you can provide that kind of value. And so it's, it's not all gravy, but you know, it does pay well. And, and I think, I think, you know, this is, I've been, I've been really, um, I'm a sales guy, man. I, I, I hope I'm, I hope my title is never greater than that. I just want to be the, the most proud sales guy ever, but this is the first time I've been able to use the skill set of connecting with people and truly help people. Right. I mean, the, the stories we have, the, 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 I actually have a client that's on this, on this carrot cast right now that is going, we have her under contract and she's going through a lawsuit of it's complete, it's a complete bully deal because she didn't choose their offer. And they think that they can bully her into, into, you know, 
whatever, selling her the house or uh, whatever. We're, they're, they're, it, the title's clear, so I don't know what the issue is. But I'm, you know, we're going through it this morning, and I'm just, I'm just listening. You know, she's got a lot more things going on in her life than than this, but her wholesaling company. And I'm like, you know, I, I was like, ironically, I'm, I'm actually on a panel today for ethically wholesaling real estate. You should join, you know, and, <laughs> and she, she texted me the thumbs up. I think she's on here. So, you know, but the stories we have and, and it is so impactful. It, so it's really kind of given me the personal satisfaction to feel like I'm serving my community, right. And, and, and serving people, you know, I, we, I've hugged, I've cried, I've prayed on, on appointments with people. Um, we know their stories. They follow us. And like Adam said, I run into them all the time. Uh, we were having lunch one day and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Hey man, who, who, who's, what was the guy's name that we did that house on California street? And he's like, uh, Conrad. I'm like, I think he's behind us. You know, and I'm like, Conrad, what's up, man? You know I mean, but transparency is the key. And when you're transparent, you're confident. I mean, and one thing I want everyone on this call to know, and, and if you'd like to reach out at home buying guys on Instagram, we've made the mistake of not being transparent before. That's how we cut our teeth in this business, you know, and those are hard conversations and the stomach, the, the stomach ache you have letting someone know you can't uh, execute, not for a reason we thought we were, we didn't do it as a strategy. We just misread the market. You know, it was a rural community or we just, we just, something happened. And it's only happened like twice out of the probably 200 transactions we've done in five years or whatever that number is now. But We've learned that way. And transparency is the key. And, and when I say transparency, I'm not just telling people, yes, we like to make a profit. I think you can understand that. I'm showing them everything. If if I think the person's interested in what I'm doing, I will, they're, I will, they're a real estate investor for the 30 minutes I'm in their home. And we're looking at the, the comps and we're pulling up the realtor.com uh, listing and I'm showing them finish out and why I'm comping it based on finish out versus this and that and how we, we flip houses based on, you know, what the comps show us, the market in that neighborhood, you know, dictates and, you know, and that, I mean, and I, I tell them, hey, I'm at 78% less ARV minus repairs. Boom. There you go. And then uh, somewhere in between there, I got to find my profit, you know, and they're like, really? And I'm like, yep. You know, and that's Dallas, that's Dallas real estate. So, I mean, it's, and it just, but if you can get comfortable with that, it, it heightens everything you do personally, because Adam, you know, I've got teenagers. My kids are a little bit older than, than Adam's. My kids can sell home buying guys. They're on every, I put every call on speakerphone. I mean, they're so over real estate. I mean, all they want to do is go like be teachers when they're older. They're so sick of these sales calls, you know, which is great, you know, but you know, I, I get to, I, because I'm so transparent, my kids understand where I'm helping people. They understand I'm being honest. They understand that. And it, and I'm so proud of who we are as a company, but in, in, in who I get to be for our sellers that it just, it just exudes confidence in these appointments. And, and that's what people are buying with the signing. They're signing, they're signing up to work with you. They're not signing up with your offer. They're not signing up with anything else. They are, they're choosing home buying guys and uh, they want to work with Lance and that's a big deal. And it, you know, the, our struggle with that is how do you scale that, right? There's only one of me, but, and, you know, and, and that's a, that's a different topic, but yeah, I mean, if you can get comfortable with it, it's, it's all, it's a heightened experience of, of, in this business and you're going to lose more deals than you win when you do it the right way. But the ones you win, you know, I don't know if they're more profitable, but my treasures are elsewhere. You know, they're not all on earth and, and I'm helping people and I'm doing it the right way. And I walk out of my door every morning with my head held high and there's not one person I've done a deal with who wouldn't shake my hand and uh, give me a bro hug. So that feels great. We're, and we're trying to clone Lance right now. So that's that's we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, I mean, transparency is key. I'm very transparent uh, as well with, with what we're doing. And that one deal was a little a little iffy, you know, it may be a gray area there, but like for the, we, we tell people we're wholesaling, even that deal I was telling you about, we tell everyone, here's what we're doing. Like there's a chance we don't find a buyer for it. And it sounds like everyone here is in agreement transparency is the key and i think a benefit as well um to having a carrot site right a carrot is designed to showcase your credibility and what everyone is talking about here is like well like short term maybe we'll make an extra buck but in the long term we're going to build so many good relationships we're going to get so many reviews it's going to come out on our site and in our marketing that that's going to be way more better for your business than than for any sure. one one deal will do right 100%. so 
that's why one reason people love carrot here, right? So we have four minutes left. Um, I'll see if I can find any questions, but does anyone have any kind of final thoughts that we didn't, there's a lot of stuff we didn't get to. I wish we had like another hour, but um, any final thoughts that anyone, anyone has here? Uh, we got a question. Here we go. How much money you make is not really relevant. If the money is the seller's motivation, we shouldn't even be buying their home. Their motivation is different. Solve the problem. And it also sounds like uh, we had a session on hybrid the other day, having multiple options, being a hybrid agent, uh, Lance and Adam, they, they're, they're contractors as well. So they can offer being an agent, they can offer buying it, they can offer just being contractors. The more options you can offer and the more you can break it down for the seller of what is truly the best for them, I think that's how you can be really ethical. Um, but any final thoughts you guys have here before we wrap it up in three minutes? I, I, I want to say one thing. Yeah, just um, as we're thinking through this, this was really eye-opening to me. I came from like an internet marketing world. And when I started doing wholesaling and going on these appointments and going into these people's houses, um, and so, like, man, people live like, there are a lot of problems. <laughs> like, um, And the one thing I would probably think is when you're going to these appointments, not to try to think of these people as dollar signs or how much profit mm -hmm. they're people, they're human beings. And I think if you're doing your job, right, I don't, you can do it a lot. Of, you can do this job a lot of different ways. That's why this panel is a topic worth talking about. But um, I, I think the right way is to look at these people with treating them with respect, with dignity, being a good listener and like, uh, empathizing with like, man, this is a real problem. So if that's the direction they want to go, just um, being a human being, being treating someone else as a human being um, in kindness, in, um, in respect is, is going to go a long way instead of just thinking like, what is the most amount of dollars I can get out of this deal? Um, I think that'll benefit that not that'll not only benefit you in the deal and in the short term, but in the long term and in Lance, like you said, the longer term, we're, we're, we may be judged one day. And so this is like very important that uh, how we treat other uh, human beings. Yeah, well said, Eric. That's perfect. That's a good way to wrap it. I will add a little Kylie Newbold quote here. He said, Mark Twain, oh, okay. if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. And yeah. like he said, trying to get to the closing table uh, can be tough, but if you're completely honest about the whole process, you won't really be stressed out at the closing table because everybody Absolutely. does everything anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So this has been great. Thank you, everybody. I know this can be a tough topic to talk about. Um, for sure. I appreciate everybody being on here. I love everyone's points of view. So th thank you all again. Carrot, thanks to you. The carrot community. Thanks to you. And this has been uh, great, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Bye, guys. Bye guys.